Well, welcome back to Mr. Obsolete's Vintage Homesteading. Well, our exciting video today is going to be we're testing four of our little top handled chainsaws that are roughly all the same displacement. And the three of them have, are all set to go. The Frontier here needed a new chain, so got some chain the other day, so I'll just do a quick brief on how to do a chain put together on it. Now, the chain that was on it was worn an awful lot, but still cuts really good. But I put a new clutch drum on it, so I wanted to have a new chain to match it. So anyway, here we've got the new chain. Right here we have a little mini vise. You tighten it down on the where you want to cut it, and then you press these rivets out. On the bottom of here, there's a tip. And that's what pushes them out. So we put that on there, and you need to center it. Exactly. Just like that. Okay, I got one out. Now we're going to do the next one here and be right back. And there we go. piece separated here and we'll be right back. Okay, well, we got everything set up to put in our new repair link. Okay, well, we've got the chain set in the, what's called a rivet spinner. And it does it spins and mashes the rivet to put a chain link together. And of course, this is the punch for pressing them out. And here's the one that we just took out. So anyway, we'll come over here and show you real close up on it how it works. Okay, well if you look close you can see that the strap here is off the rivet a little bit. And so what we do, take some pliers and pinch that together. Get it onto the rivet here, like so. And hold that tight and then we'll tighten this lever here to put some pressure on it. And then we we'll start spinning. Put some more pressure on it. And then what we we'll want to do is loosen it. Make sure our link has got some play in it, which it does. You see that the rivets Nicely spun out there, maybe just a little bit more. And the guide, the other thing it's a good idea is to use a little bit of oil on it. So we'll put a little more tension on there and spin it a little bit more. You just have to use these a while right there. That's about maximum it wants to go and still be loose. So anyway, move over to the other link here. Get everything lined up again. Let's do the same process again. Get that centered. Tighten that in. Start spinning it on there. Right there's our max. You can see right there. Perfect. Get nice and free and no side movement. Anyway, the other three saws have new chains on them. The front here didn't like I say this is really worn out and you got a new clutch drum on it. So anyway, we'll put the chain and the bar on it. And the bar here, if you look real close, you can see where I just dressed the edge off it a little bit. Had just a little bit of a lip on it, but in between here it's still good. And if you go back and watch some of my older videos I did on chains, both modern and antique ones. Well, here's a little tool. 
makes it real easy to figure out the type of chain you have. It's from Oregon. It still has them and maybe others. But you measure between the rivets. And it'll drop down over and then it tells you what one of the switches 404 and 3 8 and quarter, 325. And then it has these slots in here. And you can take the drive tooth here and slide down in there to get the proper measurements. And that's a slick little tool. I hadn't had one of these before. I was in a saw shop and picked one up, but because I've always just used calipers on it. But anyway, we'll get the saw back together and be back. Okay, well, we have the four saws ready. So what I was going to do, I'm going to re-weigh them, gas and oil in them, as they're ready to go and see what they weigh exactly. Okay, the Frontier weighs ten and a half pounds. Now, all of these four saws are anywhere from 32 to 35 cc, so they're really close in displacement. Bar lengths are pretty much the same except for the McCullough, which is a little shorter. Okay, here's the Steel O20. Twelve pounds and two ounces. Then John Deere forty V weighs fourteen pounds and five ounces. Colin Mini Mac weighs nine pounds and three ounces with fuel and oil. So we're trying to make everything as close as we can, like say displacement wise, chain wise. Three of them have Oregon on it and it still has still chain on it, which is almost identical. And the other thing I want to talk briefly about is oils again. I did a video in a while back on different oils and that was before I started using the Echo Red Armor. My old standby is Bardol VBA that was made in Seattle. And I talked about it in other videos where that when I found out they're going to quit selling it in the U.S., I bought out their entire warehouse of it. It's been using it for years, but I'm down to my last few cans. So I was looking for something that was similar. This is it. Now these are partial synthetic, and that's all I use in my old saws. Uh, the reason for that is you know the tolerances are wider on them, and. Uh, Synthetic oils, according to a couple of people that I talked to over the years, one was worked for Rams Oil as a chemist and another one for Penn's Oil and said the exact same thing, that the synthetic ester-based oils, molecules are pretty much all the same size. In a modern saw where the piston and cylinder expand at the same rate and have really tight tolerances and a high film strength, you can get by with it. On older saws, if they get overheated or something like that, and the exhaust board area always has a wider clearance, those molecules blow right by it and they seize. And so using Bardol, I've never ever had a chainsaw seize on me or any of my motorcycles, racing motorcycles, outboard motors or anything. Uh, using other brands, uh, I had one that uh, I used some Husqvarna oil and Husqvarna locked right up on me after I'd been using this in it for a long time. Somebody gave me a gallon of it forgot to tell me that's only really good for killing weeds not for lubrication and then the steel oil too I had used it for a little bit and stuff and it was really smoky and built a lot of ash and the ash is just as detrimental as carbon and so any of the ester based oils 
that's a problem with them. Um, like in the Amsoil, if you run real thin mixtures, uh, it's not that much of a problem. But if, like I try to run it in older saws at 30 or 40 to 1, it really builds up the ash bad. So I don't recommend them. So anyway, if you're really interested in oils, there's a guy that's got a YouTube channel. His name is Richard Flagg and recently started a series where he's using a lot of different brands of oil in a medium sized saws and you know, fairly new saws, you know, running them on a commercial basis, turning them down and inspecting to see how the oils perform in them. And the worst one, which I knew was going to be, was the Steel Ultra. And one of the best ones so far has been the Red, Echo Red Armor. But anyway, I suggest watching his videos. He's a down to earth mechanic, knows what he's doing, and you know, shows you why 50 to 1 really isn't enough. Anyway, let's get out to the trees. Okay, well, there's the tree and the saws are out, out here. So what I'm going to do is do three cuts, and then we'll figure accumulated time on them. And then at the end of the video, we'll check them and see which one cut the fast. Now, this tree's pretty consistent in diameter here. So, so if I'm real lucky and get four of these little miserable rascals to run, we'll get the tree cut so anyway I'll warm them each one up and then come back and start cutting Well, there we have it. This thing is a uh, new chain on it. It's really aggressive. It's really jumping around, but it really cuts good. And you know you naysayers are going to say, oh, how come it says Eager Beaver on Mac 30 Mini 35? Well, because when I got the saw, the guy had abused it so bad trying to figure out how to keep it running. Ruined the starter on it, so I had a part saw and swiped that off it. But anyway, other than that, it's all original been running for years and years. 
So anyway, we'll go in and check out the times and finish up the video. Well, the contest is over. Had a surprising winner and a surprising loser. So anyway, we're going to start out with a loser. This, uh, I can say, is a still O20 Super. Uh, find out it's not so super. So anyway, those cuts we did took 35 seconds for three cuts. And the thing that uh, all these little saws have in common is they're all finicky. And so I'll talk about the goods and bads of each one. Now this one, you know, the er ergonomics are really good. And, uh, you know, the layout's good on it. It's hard to work on. And of all the small saws I have, carburetor settings are the most touchy on this thing than any other saw I've had. Uh, just that three cuts on there, the temperature change on the saw was enough where I had to adjust the carburetor to get it to run properly again. So just a minor tweak on it makes a huge difference. And I'm going to say it's just this saw in particular, not in general on the steel 20 series. But anyway, the other thing is that, you know, a top panel saw like this is supposed to be used for entry work and arborist type work and it's porky. It's the heaviest of the saws. I was really surprised. But anyway, so I got a little goodie here for you. Come over and take a look. Okay, well, you know, a lot of my saws have little nicknames. It says right here, Steel 020 AV, which is anti-vibe super. Well, we'll put this on here, so... Steel 020, not so super. Okay, well, second place. These both cut three cuts in 30 seconds. And the steel was 35. I thought for sure the McCullough was going to be the winner, but the new brand new chain on put on here is really super aggressive. If you're watching the cut, you can see that it's bouncing up and down in the cut. So I actually measured the cutting height on here and I, I cut the chain wrong and stuff. And it's supposed to be 25 thousandths between the top of the depth gauge or raker and a tooth and it's actually a 30 thousandths and that's what you use like on a big saw so that's why it was so aggressive and but you can see that the power was never a problem with always had plenty of power just too much time hopping up and down so anyway talk about the John Deere here the thing I like about this saw it's a really nicely balanced fairly quiet it's real smooth but it's not overly powerful. That's the only drawback. And these were made by Kiritz of Japan, which is Echo today. Very nice, high quality saw. The other thing I like is this adjustable oiler here. As this knob, you can turn it back and forth. And most saws, you have to take them apart to adjust the oiler. Or a lot of them, just small saws, you can't adjust them at all. That was a really nice feature. This is just a guard. It's not a break. But anyway. It really doesn't have any drawbacks other than just being a little bit underpowered. Okay, and the Mini Mac here, the thing I like about it, it's the lightest of all the saws. It's very powerful. And, uh, you know, it's easy to hold on to. And finicky, finicky like a lot of the little saws, but this is the least finicky of the small saws that I use on a regular basis. So anyway, I've been using this for a really long time and it's done real well for me. And the winner, the little Frontier F35. And it cut in 25 seconds. The thing I like about this saw, it's very light, good ergonomics. It's not real loud and stuff. I like the longer bar on it and stuff. So this will probably be a saw I use more for arborist work than the others. And the only thing I don't like about it so far is it's really finicky. 
for starting at times. It has to be an exact, everything perfect for it to start on a regular basis. If you don't use it every day, you don't know. You just have to keep fiddling around. So anyway, this saw has a lot of hours on it too. It's possible the crank seals aren't as good as they could be. But anyway, I've only had it for a short time and it's an interesting little saw. So anyway, there you have it. The king of the mini top handle chainsaws. Well, here's our little rascals. You know, this uh, was just for fun. I'm talking about winners and losers. Uh, really, there is no losers because these little saws are really finicky. And if you can beat the odds and get them to run, and get them to run consistently, that's a winner. And so the benefits to you, the owner, you're going to become a really good mechanic. So anyway, we, one thing we're going to do is the McCullough had a way overly aggressive chain on it, was jumping all over the place. So we're going to put the old chain back on it and we'll take it out and do some cuts and see if it improved or not. But anyway, you know, it's fun working on these old saws and collecting them and, you know, the benefit you, you can actually use them. So we'll be back when we're out cutting. Okay, well, we're out here and going to be cutting some more slices here. Where we're cutting now is just about a half inch bigger than where we first started, so it might take just a little bit longer to cut. But anyway, we'll take the Mini Mac 35 here and get it warmed up and be right back. seem to be better. So we'll check our time and remember having in these little saws is a winner. Even if some are a little better than others, you can still do a lot of work with them. Go back and watch our last video and see the still out here cutting this tree down and cutting it into pieces and branching it. And you know, If you can keep them running, you can do a lot of work with any of them. So remember, vintage is best, and we'll see you on the next exciting video.